Welcome to our review for the final exam for Math 1210. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. I should mention that with the final exam, you know, first of all, congratulations to making it to the end of this course. Uh, but also, there's some important differences that we have to point out for the final exam compared to the previous midterm exams you've taken in this course. So first of all, the, the thing I first need to mention is that this exam, the final exam is a comprehensive final exam. That is, every previous topic of the class is fair game to be covered on this exam. And because the exam is comprehensive, you will notice that the length of the exam is longer. Uh, the midterm exams were typically around 15 questions. The final exam will be worth 25 questions, for which the first 15 questions will be in the multiple choice section. They're worth three points each. Uh, the last 10 questions will then be in the free response section. And you can see the vast majority of them are worth five points, except for the very last question on this exam. Uh, it's worth eight points. It's the, it's the heaviest weighted question. We'll talk about that as we get to the end of the exam. So the length of the exam is going to be different. Some other important differences is that the weight this exam has on your final grade is going to be heavier than the individual midterm exams. The time, uh, the location, the date of the exam uh, are possibly different as well. Uh, time limits, all of that stuff. You should consult uh, with your instructor or the course syllabus or on Canvas to find some of these particular informations that are going to be different. In this video, we're only going to talk about the content of the exam, the structure of the exam, the questions that you could see, uh, more of those semester to semester concerns about when, where will I take the exam. Again, consult your course syllabus to find that information. Um, what we're going to do is like past reviews we've done, we're going to go through question by question this review, uh, excuse me, through this practice exam for the review. This practice exam, of course, you can find on Canvas. But this won't be the same as other ones as well, because as the exam is comprehensive, there are more than 25 questions that a calculus student should be able to answer at the end of the semester. But to make sure that you can take the test in a reasonable amount of time, and also so I can get graded in a reasonable amount of, a reasonable amount of time, um, you won't be asked every question that one could be asked, but you could potentially be asked. Uh, what I mean by that is the exams for this course, including the final exam, are randomly generated. So by the click of a button, uh, I, I wrote a computer program so that it'll create these exams for me. Uh, saves a lot of time in the long run, right? Um, also allows to create multiple versions and things like that. Don't, don't worry about those details. But the point is, uh, we'll talk about some of the variations of the questions. Like if we're looking at question number 16, for example, uh, we'll see in a little bit that question number 16, there's not a lot of variation to question 16. But then if we move like on to question 20, there's a lot more variation. And so I'm going to tell you um, what to expect for this exam in this video. While we won't talk about the solutions of specific questions on the practice test, we're going to focus more on topics you should be studying based upon that question in the test. So you should definitely use this practice exam and the accompanying exam syllabus to help you prepare for the final exam. But I should also mention that the midterm exams you have taken in this course also are study guides for this final exam because the final exam questions, some of them will be new based upon our unit five about integrals, definite integrals, but most of the questions will become from previous units uh, units one, two, three, and four. Therefore, you can go back to the practice exams and syllabi for those exams uh, to help you study for this final exam. You can also use the actual exam with its solutions that you took during this course to help you prepare for this final exam. So if you take the practice test and the actual test, there is basically eight, eight, eight midterms you should have access to plus this practice uh, final exam, which there's a lot of, plus of course your notes, the lecture notes, the videos, uh, the homework, all of these resources are available to help you stop, start study for this exam. So with that said, let's start talking about the questions. Question number one, to give you something that's not too difficult from the get-go, question number one is going to be a calculation of limits. So a limit calculation. That limit calculation can be somewhat easy. It can be somewhat moderate. Uh, the one you see in front of you, it's you know, I don't want to, I don't want to say too much about it, but we could solve these limits by maybe continuity. Um, there's are some little bit more challenging things. Could we take the limit as X approaches infinity, a limit as X approaches a vertical asymptote, uh, excuse me, Y approaches a vertical asymptote. I should say something like that. So we talked this type of question would mostly be something from exam two about limit calculations. That's what exam two was all about. Uh, question number two 
is going to be a very basic derivative calculation. Just a very, very basic derivative calculation. Again, not trying to make it too difficult. This one, it wants to calculate the second derivative of x cubed minus 3 to the x. If you know the basic derivative rules from our unit 3 from exam 3, you're probably going to be okay on this one. Things like the power rule uh, would be pretty basic. I could ask you to find the critical number of like a polynomial that basically means take the derivative and set it equal to zero so those were type of questions primarily from exam three again the easier things on exam three uh question number three is going to be a question about anti-derivatives of some in some form or another so there was the very last section of chapter four which introduced anti-derivatives we had a question on exam four that's similar to that on this practice test, I wanted to give you a question that involves the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is a variant you can find for this question. Uh, this question, we're going to take the derivative of an integral. So what we know from the fundamental theorem of calculus is that integrals and antiderivatives from a computational point of view are essentially the same thing. So how do you take the derivative of an integral? Uh, well, the fundamental theorem of calculus part one is a very useful tool in that situation. And that's exactly what you could use to solve this question right here. Question number four, this will be another type of limit calculation, uh, but this one's going to involve piecewise functions in some degree or another. Piecewise functions had much more exotic derivatives, excuse me, more exotic limits uh, than just general functions. Uh, because like with this one, as you're approaching zero from the left, you know, does the approach from the right, does that differ? Is the two-sided limit equal, right? Uh, there were some interesting questions we saw. So in chapter two, uh, we did limits of piecewise functions all the time. We talked about continuity of piecewise functions. So for question number four, be prepared to answer a limit question about piecewise functions like we saw on exam two. Uh, question number five here is going to be another question based upon materials from unit five. So I mentioned that ab above with question number three, you should be prepared to answer questions about the fundamental theorem calculus part one. I also said questions about antiderivative. Technically speaking, that did fall under exam four, uh, be able to calculate basic antiderivatives. But what we know from the fundamental theorem of calculus part two is that computing antiderivatives is an essential skill for computing, for computing integrals. Um, and so really those ones do go hand in hand, even though uh, again, was part of exam, uh, exam four materials. Question number five, which we're talking about right now, this is the question that did not appear on any previous midterms because this question will ask your knowledge about the fundamental theorem, fundamental theorem of calculus part two. Can you calculate a definite integral? And this should be one that we could calculate the antiderivative. You should be able to calculate the antiderivative of a polynomial like three X plus one quantity squared using the fundamental theorem of calculus. There's some arithmetic, but with your calculator in hand, it shouldn't be too hard to do whatsoever. Uh, and so moving on to the next question on the first page here, question number six. This is going to be another derivative calculation. You'll remember from exam three, the whole idea of exam three was our techniques of integration. So while exam or question two on well, this exam will be sort of an easy uh, an easy derivative calculation. Question six will be more on the mo the moderate side. Uh, so this question will involve something like a trigonometric function, maybe like an inverse trigonometric function could come into play. Uh, a logarithm could be used on this one, maybe a hyperbolic function. So basically question number six will ask you to compute the derivative in some degree or another, but we're going to do the derivative of one of these transcendental functions, trig trigonometry, uh, exponentials, logarithms, hyperbolic functions, their inverses. That's what you should prepare for on question number six. Again, these are these are type of questions we saw on exam three. Question number seven is going to be a topic that's new to the final exam. That is, it's a topic coming from unit five. Uh, and so therefore, you don't have a previous example of it. But what we're going to do is on question number seven is you'll be asked to estimate. You'll be asked to approximate a integral. So in this case, you have to compute or you have to approximate the integral from 14 to 26 of a function f of x dx. And you're going to use the right endpoint approximation for this one. I mean, that's what this example is. As you're preparing for the final exam, you might be asked to do a left endpoint approximation, maybe a midpoint or a trapezoidal uh, endpoint approximation. Those are fair game as well. Now, what you should expect on question number seven is question number seven will give you 
a the function as a table. You will not have an algebraic formula. You will not have a graph. You will have a table with just isolated numerical calculations. The reason I will do this is that because you have a table, the fundamental theorem of calculus will not apply. You do not have enough information to determine whether the function is continuous or not. You do not have enough information to calculate the antiderivative. But you do have enough information to approximate the area of the curve using things like R3, L3, M3, those types of approximations we did in Chapter 5. So be prepared to approximate integrals using Riemann sums, a finite Riemann sum. This is a topic we haven't seen on a previous exam. Likewise, question number 8 will also be a topic we did not see on a previous exam. Uh, question number 8 will be something to do with summation notation. All right, so with these sums, how do you calculate a sum like, for example, the sum where k ranges from 1 to 14 of k squared minus 4? Um, this sum could be a Riemann sum or it could just be a general sum uh, uh, like this arith uh, this sum that you see on the screen, maybe an arithmetic sum or geometric sum, uh, types of things we did in Chapter 5. So consult the corresponding lecture notes, videos, uh, homework, your personal notes, etc., to prepare for something like that. Again, question number seven and question number eight, these ones I'm putting boxes around, these are questions that come from chapter five and haven't been on a previous midterm, so there's not gonna be as much variability. Clearly on question number eight, the specific sequence, the specific sum in play will change, but you will be asked to compute a sum. That variability won't go away. Because you've never been asked a question about summations on any previous midterms, I do have to ask you such a question on the final exam. Question number nine is going to be a question about derivatives. Uh, this one you have, this one asks you to find the derivative of the square root of x times e to the x. Question number nine will test your knowledge on the product rule or the quotient rule. You'll only be given one of them, uh, but they're similar in nature, and so randomly selecting one seems like a fair process. The quotient rule and product rule came up on exam three, so by all means go back to those tests to look at some examples of what you might expect uh, for question number nine. Question number 10 is going to be a question about limits of indeterminate forms. So like with this one, if you just plug in theta equals zero, you end up with zero over zero. This is a situation which you probably want to use L'Hopital's rule. Uh, L'Hopital's rule is a very useful form when you have, excuse me, a useful tool when you have a limit of the form zero over zero or infinity over infinity. But we should also be prepared for things like zero times infinity. Uh, we should be prepared for one to the infinity, zero to infinity, uh, actually, zero to the infinity is always zero. Uh, but the other ones we talked about in the class, infinity to the zero, zero to the zero, we should be built, we should prepare to handle these indeterminate forms using L'Hopital's rule. So you'll see that here on question number 10. L'Hopital's rule was covered on exam four, so consult that exam for some more practice questions. Uh, question number 11 is going to be a question that involves either the first or second derivative test. Uh, we had two questions on exam four, one about the first derivative test, uh, one about the second derivative test. On the final exam, you will be randomly selected to answer one of those types of questions. So again, go to exam four for some practice on that one. Uh, question number 12 will be a question about the chain rule. The chain rule, uh, very fairly stated, is the most important of all of the derivative rules we learned in chapter three. You had a question on chapter three about the chain rule. Question number 12 for this final exam will involve the chain rule. No variability about that whatsoever. The specific functions obviously in play will change. Like you don't necessarily expect to get the fourth root of x to the fourth plus 16, but calcul the calculation of the derivative of f here will involve the chain rule. You should expect that for your final exam as well. Uh, computing a derivative with the chain rule is an essential learning outcome for every Calculus 1 student. So I will ask you at least question 12 requiring you use the chain rule. There, of course, the chain rule might be relevant for other questions as well. Question number 13, still in the multiple choice section, will be a question uh, about implicit differentiation, which admittedly implicit differentiation showed up in, um, in exam three in the free response section. For purposes of structure of the exam, those questions have been reformatted to be multiple choice questions, which you could see here, like the example here on question number 13. Uh, question number 13 might also ask you about logarithmic differentiation, which again, logarithmic differentiation was a technique we learned about 
for exam three. It showed up in the free response section, but this has now been migrated to the multiple choice section. So you won't get any partial credit, uh, but you also have the advantage of guessing now if you get stuck. So be prepared for that uh, question number 13. Question number 14 is going to be an approximation uh, question of some kind. It could ask you to use Newton's method. It could also ask you about linearization, which linearization is the baby version of Newton's method. Both of these questions showed up on exam four in the multiple choice section. You'll be asked to answer a question about Newton's method or linearization on the multiple choice section of this final exam. You'll be one or the other. You should be prepared to do both. Uh, question number 14. 15 is going to sort of be a catch-all type question, uh, meaning that on previous exams, exam 2, 3, and 4, there were questions involving graphs of functions, like you see one right here, and those graphs of, uh, graphs of functions ask you things about what are the limits of this function? Where is this function continuous? Where is this function differentiable? Um, if this is the graph of f prime, what can you say about f? Uh, just, just to name a few examples, right? Uh, there are many questions in the multiple choice that give you a graph and then ask you some calculus question from the graph. Um, that is going to be question 15. It's going to randomly select one of those questions about the graph of a function, where again, you're calculating something about the limit, the integral, uh, I, I should say integral, the derivative, and you'll answer something in that regard. So go back to exams two, three, and four to help you prepare for a question like this. Now, before we move on to the free response section, I do wanna mention that as you're studying for this exam, uh, this final exam, don't put a lot of emphasis on exam one. Recall that exam one was a review of pre-calculus. This is the calculus final. So are we going to have ask questions that basically ask you to review pre-calculus at the end when you're proving you know calculus? The answer is no, -uh, not going to happen. Uh, because the reason we spent so much time and we had a whole test about pre-calculus is that in order to do calculus problems, you must be proficient in pre-calculus. You know that. I'm preaching to the choir right now. But... I don't need to ask you pre-calculus questions because every calculus question has a substantial amount of pre-calculus. So don't put a lot of emphasis on exam one. There is one exception um, about computing difference quotients that I'll point to you later on in this exam when we reach that point. So with that said, let's move on to the free response section. Uh, the first question, question number 16, is going to be an extreme value type problem, the extreme value theorem, which told us that a continuous function on a closed interval always has an absolute maximum and absolute minimum. We did questions like that. There was a question like this in the free response section on exam number four. You will do that type of question on this exam. No variability here. This question, number 16, will be an extreme value problem. Find the absolute maximum and the absolute minimum of a continuous function on a closed interval. No exceptions there. The only difference will be the function you have to use and the interval that we use for its domain. So be prepared to do that. This is a question taken straight from exam number four. Question number 17 is going to be a question, a question about tangent lines. Now recall that on exam two, you had to compute the tangent line of a given function. But when we did exam two, our derivative techniques were not highly developed yet. Basically, the only thing we had was compute the derivative from the definition that is the limit of a difference quotient. So when you saw this question on number two, exam number two, I gave you the derivative um, and then you had to find the equation of the tangent line. Uh, likewise, on exam three, you had to compute the tangent line, uh, excuse me, the equation of a tangent line given an implicit curve. That is, you had to find the slope of the tangent line implicitly. So this is an important learning outcome that we understand that the derivative measures the slope of the tangent line. Can you find the equation of a tangent line? So go to exams two and three for practice. But the question you saw on exam two, will be, this one will be harder because this one will not give you the derivative. You would now be expected to compute the derivative of sine which hopefully should not be too much of a problem for you if you're at the final exam for this course. So again, this is going to be a question about tangent lines. Question number 18 is going to be a question about optimization, which was another story problem we did on exam number four. No exceptions. Question number 18 will be a story problem about optimization. Now, what are the type of optimization problems we saw? I would go back to the lecture notes, go back to the homework for some examples. Uh, that'll include things like maximizing area when we constrain uh, perimeter or vice versa. We might want to minimize perimeter if we constrain area. We could do that for some rectangles or triangles or for a circle. Um, also three-dimensional versions like you see in front of us. If we constrain 
uh, basically the surface area of a rectangular prism, can we maximize the air, uh, the volume of said thing? Can we do similar things for like a cone or for a sphere or for a cylinder? Uh, those are some examples of geometric problems we've done before. I don't expect you to memorize various uh, geometric formulas for three-dimensional uh, shapes. Like you don't need to know the volume of a cone or a cylinder or anything like that. I'll provide those things for you. Uh, but some of the simpler ones you should be expected to do. Like a, in this case, you're not given the volume formula of a rectangular prism, aka a box. And that's because it's length times width times height. That one's not so unreasonable to expect people to be able to do. Uh, so be able to solve an optimization problem. This can be an optimization problem about uh, non-geometric things as well. I like to do geometric things because this is, after all, a math class. But sometimes we could do physical or economic examples. Like, can you find the maximum profit if you're given the cost function and revenue function? Uh, that's a great question we saw in the homework. That is fair game uh, for what we saw in exam four. It's fair game for what we saw on the final, uh, final exam. If you saw it on a previous exam, it's fair game for the final exam as well. Uh, the last question on this page, question number 19, this one also is going to get a special block around it uh, because this is a question you definitely want to practice uh, special hard because this question did not appear on any of the previous exams. Uh, this is a question taken from our very last lecture, in fact, about U substitution. Uh, you should be able to compute a, uh, and you, excuse me, you should be able to compute a indefinite integral using this technique of u substitution. Uh, that is, you set u equal to whatever, you set du equal to whatever, you make the substitution, calculate the antiderivative. So this is the very last, the very last unit we learned about. We didn't see that on a previous exam, obviously. So be able to compute antiderivatives using the technique of u substitution. Uh, that's all I can really say for question number 19. Moving on to question number 20. Question number 20 will be a, a story problem. Uh, but this this question could from could come from exam number three or exam number four. Recall on exam number three, we had various questions about scientific applications of derivatives. Uh, so like the one you see on the screen right now, if you have the position function of a particle, can you find its acceleration? Can you find its velocity? This is related to the derivatives of that function. This is this type of stuff we did on exam three. We had a question about that. Uh, like, for example, marginal cost is the derivative of cost. How do you analyze things like that? Uh, but we also could get the corresponding question from exam four, which asked us to do scientific applications of antiderivatives, or like we see in chapter five about definite integrals. How if we calculate the, the integral of velocity, that will give us the displacement or the net change of position. That is the net change theorem we learned about in chapter five. That's also eligible for this question. So maybe we put a bracket, a box around that one to give you an example. Uh, but also, uh, also for example, the antiderivatives we learned about before. Like if we know if we know the velocity function and we have some information about initial position, that's the type of question we could have seen on exam four. That's an eligible question for number twenty. So again, scientific interpretations of derivatives, antiderivatives, and integrals. That's the type of thing you're going to see on question number twenty. Uh, question 21, this is going to be a related rates question. And that's the end of the story, right? Uh, you will do a related rates question on question 21. Uh, we did that at the end of chapter three. So it showed up on the chapter three test. Uh, admittedly, it could have been in chapter four as well, applications and derivatives. But just for organization, we put it on the exam, on exam three. And so same type of things, as I said, with optimization. You don't need to know three-dimensional geometric formulas beyond like a rectangular prism. Uh, you should know two-dimensional ones. Like you should be able to calculate the perimeter area of triangles and rectangles, um, the area and circumference of a circle. Those ones you should know from memory, uh, but I'll give you formulas for three-dimensional things. You should know the Pythagorean equation and other trigonometric ratios as those are examples we've done. So again, consult the, the past test, the practice test, the homework to get an idea of what to expect on these type of story problems. Or if you have any particular questions, send me an email and I'll be glad, or just comment you know, on this video, and I'll be glad to answer those questions if you have some specific questions about this or that. All right, moving on to question 22. Uh, this is an important question to label here uh, because this is another topic from chapter five. This will be asking you to compute a definite integral using the definition of the integral. So this reminder, if you take the integral from a to b of f of x dx, this is by definition the limit 
as n goes to infinity of the sum, the Riemann sum, where i ranges from 1 to n, of f of xi star, although you can you can pick. It doesn't matter when you do. If f is continuous, it doesn't matter which, uh, which choice you do for xi star. So for simplicity, I'll just do xi times delta x, where remember delta x is equal to b minus a over n, and xi is equal to a plus i times delta x. So you make that substitution in right here, and you do this substitution in right here, and you're gonna compute and simplify this thing. This is a challenging question, but this is an important learning outcome for Calculus 1 students. So you must be prepared to calculate a definite integral by the definition, that is as a limit of a room and sum. Now, when you look at something like this, it's very tempting to use the fundamental theorem calculus because yeah, that makes it a whole lot easier. I give you that. And you can check your answer using the fundamental theorem calculus if you want to, but if the only work you show is what comes from the fundamental theorem, that is you calculate an antiderivative and evaluate at the endpoints, you will get no credit for that. This question, the five points will only come from the definition of an, of an integral and the comp computation of such. Again, use FTC to check your answer, but if that's all you do, you would get no credit for such a thing. So be prepared. You have now been warned. Question number three is going to be similar to it. Uh, this version of question number three you see actually comes from question, or exam one. This one asks you to set up and simplify a difference quotient. So this is the only question from exam one that I'm going to put on the final exam, maybe. The other version of question 23 you might see is very similar to what you saw in question number two. You'll be asked to set up and compute the derivative by the definition. That is, can you use the definition of the derivative? Can you recognize that the derivative f prime of x is equal to the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h? So can you compute the derivative using the limit of the difference quotient? Now this question asks you, this one that you see on the screen just asks you to set up and simplify the difference quotient. That's a necessary step when you're trying to calculate the derivative by the definition. It's just there's one extra step at the end and it's evaluating the limit as h goes to zero. That's not the hard part. And that's why I'm willing to use uh, the definition of the derivative, which we saw on exam number two, or just simplify the difference quotient, which we, seen, which we saw in number one. Uh, the, the, again, the, di the difficulty, the difference in difficulty of those two questions is marginal, um, and therefore either one is acceptable. But again, if you were asked, what's the derivative of x squared plus x plus one? I don't know why my voice sounds like that when I ask a question on a test, but now it does. If you're asked to compute the derivative of x squared plus x plus one using the definition, and you're like, oh, f prime of x equals two x squared plus one, and you're like, it follows from the power rule, eh, just like the previous question, no. Um, that is correct, and you can use that to check your answer, but this question 23 is trying to assess your knowledge and proficiency with difference quotients. If you don't use a difference quotient, then you won't get credit because you're not, you're not, I can't assess you if you don't demonstrate the learning outcome that this question is seeking, and that's why the instructions tell you, do it by the definition. If you do it any other way, that's breaking the rules, and you can't get any credit for that. Uh, the last question on this page question 24 is going to be, it's going to be a hodgepodge of questions. Uh, we'll say this is going to be our proof question. On various tests, we've had some questions that ask you to prove things. It's so like, for example, on question number two, you, there was a question involving the intermediate value theorem for which if a function was continuous and it was somewhere positive, somewhere negative, that implies it has an x-intercept and that x-intercept would be the solution of an equation. Therefore, you can prove the existence of a solution using the intermediate value theorem. We had a question like that on exam number two. The final exam might ask you to answer that question. Another question that showed up on exam number two was proving the, proving the limit of such a function was what it is using the squeeze theorem. Are we proficient, using a, uh, are we proficient with squeeze theorem arguments? This question number 24 might ask you to do such a thing. Um, another version we could see, like you see on the screen right now, is could we compute a derivative as this proof? Like, could we prove that the derivative of arc cosecant is negative 1 over x times the square root of x squared minus 1? We did various proofs like that in Chapter 3. And on the Chapter 3 test, you had to be, you were expected to answer such a question. So can you prove derivatives of inverse trig or inverse hyperbolic or logarithms are what they are. Could you prove their derivatives are what they are using implicit differentiation? Could you prove the derivative of e to the x is e to the x? Or how about the derivative of sine is cosine or cosine is negative sine? Those arguments we did in class and you were expected to be able to understand and reproduce similar type proofs. 
Um, in chapter four, we learned about the mean value theorem. And there was a question on chapter four test about the mean value theorem. So question 24 is gonna ask you to prove one of these things. You won't be asked to prove all of them, but as you will be randomly selected to answer one of these four, you do need to be prepared to answer each and every one of these types of questions that we saw in previous exams. This now gets us to the last question, question number 25. This will be a curve sketch question, just like we saw as the last question on exam number four. You'll be given some grid lines, so you can graph the function. You'll be given some places where you are expected to show your work. If these, if these tabs are blank, you'll lose credit for that. If you say nothing about the domain, you lost a point. If you say nothing about symmetry, you'll lose a point. You get the idea here. So preferably, like I did in the solution videos, you should fill these things out as appropriate, given the function in play. And then once all of those things are filled out, put all the information into the picture and graph the picture from there. And that's why this question is the heaviest question on the test. The multiple choice questions are worth three points. The every other free response question is worth five. Curve sketch, which takes up the whole page, is worth eight. Um, it's all you know. It's about fifty percent harder in terms of score compared to all the other free response questions. And so it, it's a big deal because there's a lot of work that you need to show to be able to do these things accurately. Again, curve sketching showed up on chapter four. So you'll notice that our final exam, I would say is somewhat skewed, right? There are lots of questions coming from chapter four. There are lots of questions coming from chapter five that did not appear on previous exams. And why is that? Well, the chapter five thing is, since there's no previous exams that tested you on it, I have to test you on you eventually, the final. But also the chapter five things are the, the, I, let me just say it this way. This is a comprehensive test, but the course is inherently a comprehensive course, right? In order to be successful in chapter four, which is applications of derivatives, you have to be good at derivative calculations. So I can ask you story problems like related rates, optimization, extreme value theorem. I can ask you those questions and they require you to compute the derivative. So if you're not good at computing derivatives, you're not going to be good at doing an optimization problem. And so I can really gauge your understanding of the material on the latter end of topics in this course because they are naturally built on top of other things. Now, there are some questions, yes, from chapter two, from chapter three, uh, because I do want to test particular things like said chain rule, what have you. And the derivatives you calculate on an optimization problem might not be too difficult, but because of that, there is going to be a, there is going to be skewed uh, the, the, that is the topics are skewed. There are bias towards chapter four and chapter five because if you're good on topics from chapter four and chapter five, I know you're good in topics from one, two, and three. I said it earlier in this video. Why are there why was there only one question about chapter one? And that one question about chapter one is 50-50. It could be simplify the difference quotient. It could be calculate the derivative using a difference quotient, right? The why is chapter one not represented and why is chapter four so heavily represented? Because again, if you can do chapter four, then you can do chapter three. Then you could do chapter one. I don't need to ask you chapter one questions because every stinking question on this test involves knowledge of pre-calculus. You wouldn't have made it this far if you couldn't do stuff from pre-calculus. That I know. And so with that, I'm going to wrap up our review video. Uh, thanks for watching. As usual, if you have any questions about this exam, please don't hesitate to ask. Uh, the, this video, you can find a place where you can post questions right there in the comments. Please do so if you have any questions so that you and all of your other classmates can benefit from the question and the answer. Um, if you're not exactly comfortable with that, by all means, you can send me an email. You can come by office hours. You can go by the tutoring center. Uh, there are so many resources uh, including the ones I mentioned that you can use to study for this exam. If you do not know how to study for this calculus exam, please reach out to your classmates, form a study group. Please reach out to me, your instructor, or some other math, uh, some other mathematician that you know and trust. Get the help you need. You don't have to go into this blind. And with that, we're going to end this video. And hopefully I'll hear some questions from you soon. Bye, everyone.